Hey folks, welcome back to another edition of the show, Midweek with Eric Smith. Thanks again to Leo Routens for joining me last week. Daniela, Susie, good to see you. Thanks for coming back again. And my guest tonight is Raptors television analyst and longtime member of the Canadian national team. Pro player, played overseas for a number of years, and of course he's been my colleague for quite some time on the uh, TV radio side of things, Sherman Hamilton. And uh, I'm going to bring Sherman into the mix right now, and we will get going. Sure, I'm good to see you. Hey, good. How you doing? I'm good, man. I haven't seen you in a few weeks. I know it's it's uh it's, <laughs> it's getting out there now. It, it is it is definitely getting out there. Yeah. It's looking good though. Hey, trying to keep up with a vet like you. Man, I was I was saying to Alvin Williams, our colleague, the other day. He he has a similar look right now with the beard and the and the and the shaved down head. He kind of looking like Uncle Phil. Uh, <laughs> Alvin looks way better than me, so I'll take Uncle Phil. <laughs> Hey, I appreciate you doing this, and uh, lots of lots of Raptor talk, folks, over the course of the next hour. It's 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 crazy for me, and I said this last night in in chatting with uh, Leo Routens. Sherm, I can't believe that it's been a year as as long as these past you know five almost five and a half months have seemed. Twenty twenty has been a grind for so many reasons. There's still part of me that says, as long as these last five have felt, the previous seven seem to whiz by because I can't believe that we are talking about the one-year anniversary of Game 5, let alone just a couple of days away from the one-year anniversary of the actual title. Yeah, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. And uh, it, it, for, for guys like us who have been around it a while and had been in the business for so long and had covered this team for so long, that whole moment seemed like a whirlwind when you talk about their run to a championship. So it's um, – it's very kind of weird to look back at it and say, well, that happened a year ago. That craziness, that that excitement is all a year behind us now. And, yeah. and it kind of seems that way based on what we're going through now. You know, things have been so haywire over the last little while. It kind of makes you kind of try to reflect on some positive things when you come to that anniversary. And now you're looking at it and saying, that was a pretty special time. And I think this is now when we get to really enjoy and really appreciate that run that the Raptors had to that championship. I mean, it's hard to do it in the moment, but the further away you get from it and you see how difficult it was, you really appreciate what was tra what transpired. Sure. You mentioned the moment and, and the moment just uh, a month ago was, was, you know, rightly or wrongly solely focused on COVID-19. The moment certainly right now over the last uh, couple of weeks now has evolved into something much bigger and, and probably something that should have been uh, talked about for, for, for quite some time and, and given much more focus than perhaps it, 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 it has or it was. Uh, obviously, you know, speaking about um, the, the, the death, the murder, the killing of George Floyd and the trickle-down effect uh, from that and the collective wake-up call for so many across the United States, across Canada, and across the globe um, – I'd be remiss if we didn't at least start our conversation talking a little bit about that. I know in our last conversation, when you joined me about six weeks ago, uh, part of your story, part of your upbringing as a kid from Malton uh, involved at times uh, dealing with, you know, just the, the color of your skin and, and the struggle that you might've gone through, whether it be in school and athletics and whatnot. Um, where are you at mentally right now in terms of everything that has, that has happened uh, and your reaction to, uh, everything that's kind of unfolded in the last, uh, you know, 10 to 14 days? Uh, well, it's been difficult. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those times that we're living in history. And, it, and it, it's, it's really, really hard to grasp that the 2020 version of a lynching happened right before everybody's eyes. We saw a black man murdered in broad daylight by an officer, an officer surrounding him that did nothing to prevent it that felt entitled, felt okay, felt it was the right thing to do, had no compassion, no empathy for another human being. And when you look at it from that perspective, and he knew he was being filmed, he knew people were watching him, yep. he didn't care. And when you think about how lynchings were conducted back in the day, everybody came around to see it, everybody made fun of the person that was being hung from a tree, kids, adults alike, and it was a spectacle to be made fun of. And this was a spectacle that was just as disgusting when you think about how it transpired in broad daylight. So for me personally, 
there's a lot of anger, but it's not mm-hmm. that crazy, unabashed anger. It's it's very focused, it's concerted, and it's determined. And and it, it's not something that I feel is going to go away anytime soon. And it better not go away anytime soon. Changes have to be made for this situation to be rectified. And and if we can't in this moment, as people understand the gravity of what transpired and how it impacts so many people, I think we're really in trouble as a human race. And uh, my, my belief is that things are going to change and they have to change because we're not going to stop until they do change. And, and at this point in our history, it's a defining moment. And I've said this to people many times. There's no waffling on this. There's no towing the line. There's no sitting on the fence. There's no great area to operate in. Which side are you on? Make it clear. Make it obvious. And do something about it. Because we're not into hanging around and having these discussions about why you should be. We're past that. It's about doing something and making the right decision. Sure. I, I appreciate and I respect the fact that you said that because, you know, and, and as, a, as a white man, I say that as well, that there is no gray. There is clearly a right side and a wrong side. And there is clearly a, a, a choice that everybody needs to make right now. And the way that you just laid it out in terms of the division, the line that is there, there is no wavering. There is no dipping a toe on both sides. And now that's how I feel. I hope that's how most people feel. Um, but I feel like this time right now in this moment in history, and I'm, I'm asking you maybe as well, why do you think it's different? Because it does feel different this time. It feels even more different right now than it did four years ago when Colin Kaepernick and others kind of first, I, I, that's wrong, not first, but brought it to light again and tried to fight the fight again. And as much as he got support, and as much as there was some support, it kind of fizzled out. It feels and it seems different this time. Well, it's different for a few reasons. Uh, Number one, it's different because of the global pandemic that we're in. I mean, Mm -hmm. people are kind of sequestered, quote unquote, on their own in their homes for, for a large amount of time. And There's nothing else. There's no sports on. Everything has basically been grinded to a halt. And in those moments, there's no distractions. Things that happen are front and center. And when they're as egregious as what we saw happen to to George Floyd, you can't avoid it. You can't say I was too busy. You can't say I was distracted. You can't say I didn't know because it permeated the conversation. Whether you wanted to talk about it or not, you knew about it. The other thing is that There's a tipping point. There's a point where things just can't continue to go the way they're going. And that happened with this situation. It's not that the Trayvon Martins, the Eric Gardners, the Philip Castillo and all these guys don't deserve and all these people don't deserve the same approach. But what we're seeing is that this is the tipping point. This is the moment that change has to happen. And, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned Colin Kaepernick and, and in terms of what he did, I thought that he did something that was so important when he did it a few years ago. But I am not impressed with this whole idea of seeing cops take a knee. It doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense to me at all. Understand that when Colin Kaepernick took a knee, it was in response to the violence against black people. It was at a football game which it was in direct contention with the national anthem. He got people's attention on the field in terms of the national anthem and what that flag represented to people who went to war and came back and weren't considered human beings. When I see a cop take a knee on the road, it's an officer in a uniform on the street taking a knee. That is a symbol of how we saw George Floyd die Taking a knee on the street doesn't make any sense to me. You want to take a knee? Let's see you do it at the next game you're at, your favorite sport. Let's see you take a knee at the national anthem. Let's see you take a knee when you're somewhere where the flag is being waved and you take a knee at that point. I don't want to see you taking a knee in the middle of the street. That's symbol. That's, that's the equivalent of, of, of bringing the noose, hang, holding a noose back in the day and say, I don't agree with hanging people. I don't want to see you holding a noose. I want to see you do something that impacts the movement and changes the narrative for people in law enforcement 
and for white people in general. So I, I, I just don't understand that. But I'm going off topic a bit, but I understand that this time and the, the pandemic has created a real vacuum for people to sit and really have to examine this thing, have to have those conversations, have to maybe have those hurtful conversations with people, and maybe you have to distance from some people, but it's time. And e, we've talked about this many times in terms of, you know, the, the idea that there is privilege given to people, even in our business, we see it all the time. And the difficulty is talking about it. That's the difficulty because there's a certain establishment that doesn't want to be ruffled and doesn't want to be disturbed. It's going to get disturbed now. There's going to be people that are going to have their feelings hurt. Get over it. We've had our feelings hurt all our life. Sure. I, I don't know if you've seen yet or not, um, former NFL player and, and NFL analyst now, uh, Emmanuel Achu uh, and, and his uh, Instagram handle. And he's had something that, that has certainly gained a lot of steam in just the last few days. And it's been out there for a while, but um, he's, he's been posting um, uncomfortable conversations with a black man. And it kind of speaks to the point that you're just discussing in terms of it may take uncomfortable conversations. It may take conversations, whether it's in part what we're doing right now or with other people where you have to confront. And when I say you, I think I'm speaking more to white folks confronting um, what, they, what they either acknowledge is inside them or what they don't even realize is inside them and maybe acknowledging the privilege that they don't even know they had or that they're conscious that they had. And just finally, as we talked about a few minutes ago, taking a stand but also being willing to look inside themselves to see what it is that they can do to help change. What would you like to see change right now or, or how would you recommend having some of those conversations? They have to be blunt. They have to be straightforward. They have to understand in a conversation like that, that any type of waffling is going to be perceived as something other than support. And, and I think when you talk about the uncomfortable conversations, not concerned about that, to be honest with you. I, I think mm -hmm. that when you think about it, a person being uncomfortable with a conversation like that can't really talk to somebody like me who has had uncomfortable situations throughout the course of my life that I've never had a chance to get out from under. And I know another one's coming. That's just the course of history for people like me. So yep. I'm not concerned with people being uncomfortable past that. The times for conversations that would have accommodated people's feelings for being uncomfortable, it wasn't acknowledged. It wasn't a time for these people to have these conversations. Well, now they're going to be forced to have those conversations, not concerned with the uncomfortable situations. And you mentioned about, you know, some people not knowing about their white privilege. I, I struggle to, to believe that white people, and this is a general statement I know, don't understand that there's a difference between the way they're treated in this world and the way we're treated in this world. I don't think anybody is oblivious to that. I am just constantly amazed and disappointed at some of the simple things that white privilege has allowed them to overlook and not realize that it is white privilege. Some basic things like walking down the street and not realizing that people actually have a concern if they see me walking as opposed to you walking. Right. And, and here's the thing. And this is a perfect time to talk about this, E. You, myself, and Paul Jones were involved in a moment, maybe eight to 10 years ago. And uh, yep. I, I don't know if you've talked about this already, but. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you right now, you go ahead and tell the story because I had Jonesy on last week on Thursday and we got into a number of stories and I can retell a couple of them if you like in, involving myself and Jonesy and Mike James who played with the Raptors, of course. Uh, but we did reference and we were up against the clock and we did not get into the nuts and bolts. And, and I'll just quickly say uh, it was myself, Jonesy and Sherm heading to go over the border to visit with Jack Armstrong to golf at the Niagara Falls Golf and Country Club. And this incident happened at the Queenston-Lewiston border, uh, basically Fort Erie, Ontario, and, and Lewiston, New York, the state of New York. So I'll give you the floor there, Sherman, and, and please go ahead and tell the story. All right. Well, as, as Eric said, we're driving, and uh, we're, we're all hanging out, talking, chatting, laughing it up. We get to the border, and as usual, you pull up. And I think Jonesy was driving. Is that correct? It is, yeah. You, oh, yeah. you were in the front seat and I was in right. the back. 
Right. So yeah. Jonesy was driving, and uh, we pull up to the to the border person, and and Jonesy winds down his windows. Yeah, he, he looks in the car. Eric, you wound down your window as well in the back, and yep. uh, he looks in the car and he asks for passports, identification, not passports, identification. And we all had our passports, and uh, we handed it over, and uh, he looked at mine and Jonesy's. He didn't look at yours. And he asked where we're going. We tell him how long we're going to be there. You know, the usual questions. Yep. And then he turned to you mm -hmm. and he asked. You're back. Uh, I don't know if it was mine or yours, Sherm. Um, I don't know. But 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 either way, yeah, it froze up for a second, and he, and it, at least where it dropped out for me, I don't know about others, but it was basically they he asked for your passports. He looked at yours. He didn't look at mine, and then he looked into the back seat and 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 spoke to me directly. Right, and he asked you if you were okay. And yeah. and it was in that moment, there was kind of this eerie feeling amongst all of us about what just transpired as we drew, drove off. Yeah. And we had that discussion about it. And amongst us, we were kind of joking and saying, well, I, using some colorful language, that that was pretty messed up in terms of of what he just did. And and Jonesy and I just kind of said, you know, this is the kind of stuff that happens. And, and yeah. you were complaining about it, saying it's BS and, you know, how stupid it was that he did that. But in that moment, that's a singular moment for you. That's something that happened around you but yeah. not to you. It happened to Jonesy and myself. Right. That's not an isolated situation. Those kind of moments happen throughout the course of our life. You know, I, I equated, Ian, I, I went to school in Florida for one year. And I think back to that time, I got pretty much hemmed up by police officers because I looked like someone they were looking for. And I'll just explain it to, quickly, explain it to you quickly. I went to a, a variety store, which was across the street from campus, and I went in there, got some chips, something to drink, and I came out the store, and these police cruisers pulled in with speed, almost screeching with their lights flashing, high beams on. They jump out the car, weapons drawn, telling me to get on the ground. I have no clue what's going on. I'm this kid from Canada. I haven't even been in Florida for a month. And I'm walking out of this variety store, and here I am getting drawn, guns drawn on me, telling me to get on the ground. I drop the stuff in my hands. I get on the ground. They walk up to me. They have the guns pointed at me. Ask me who I am. What's your name? Where are you coming from? What are you doing? All of these things are happening with guns drawn on me, and the moment is so intense. When I think about all the people the black men that have been killed or injured in that situation, I get it. I get why they're afraid. I understand because in that moment, if those cops decided to finish me, you're not hearing about me. And I would have yeah. resisted arrest and I would have been the one that created the, the issue and I'm dead. So it's, it's, it's unreal when I see stuff like that and to understand how close that could have been to my story in terms of what could have happened to me. So, that's the height of it, but there's all kinds of other things over the course of my life that has happened that reflect racism in Canada as well. And, and I, I really get bothered when people say, well, that's a U.S. thing. It's not like that in Canada. Oh, yes, it is. If mm -hmm. you just think about our country and what we did to the indigenous people of this country. Well, we're still doing. And, and still doing. You can't tell me that this country has clean hands. No way. I've experienced it. And they've experienced it. Our indigenous brothers and sisters have experienced it way worse. Sure. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, certainly, you know, in terms of the story you just told of the incident in Florida as well. I, I do want to jump back for one second to, because I saw Jonesy's. I wish, I wish Instagram Live, you could actually bring on, you know, two or three or four people like a Zoom call or something so we could expand the conversation. Because I know Jonesy's watching right now and has been actually 
um, commenting a little bit uh, in, in the message section to some, some folks that have come in. Mm -hmm. What I remember about that incident more than anything was, and, and listen, I've, I've, I've never even heard you say it the way you just did, and you're bang on. It, it, I was involved in the incident, but it didn't happen to me. And I probably have said multiple times, not probably, I have said multiple times, you wouldn't believe what happened to me and Jonesy and Sherm. In the end, you're right. Nothing really did happen to me. But I remember in the moment, initially not even understanding the question, when the, the, the Border Patrol officer said, are you okay? I, I remember thinking, yeah? <laughs> what do you mean? And it was within maybe a two seconds where the light went like, oh. And I remember being as like as pissed off or maybe not as, but certainly pissed off about the question, let alone the, the obviousness to me of the answer. But then as we drove away, you're right. I'm sitting in the back seat, just scratching my head, but I have no idea what's going through Jonesy's mind, your mind, as we're now trying to go have a nice day of golf with Jacko and, and, you know, have some fun on the course and go for dinner and everything else and how that weighs on your mind the rest of the day, let alone, what might happen when we cross back across the border? Have we been flagged? Has the car been flagged, et cetera? Oh, yeah. And I know, I know one of the questions came in from, from Daniela, and she's a regular uh, follower and watcher here, and we appreciate the time. And, and she said, why didn't you report him or did you report him? And as Jonesy noted, there's potential worse kickback, flack risk of reporting the guy, especially if we're coming back, let alone the implications that might impact you, Jonesy, and probably not even me, when you try to cross the border again in a couple of weeks, a couple of months, or when you're flying out of Pearson and there's a little note, a little, little red flag on your record, on your passport. You know, it's interesting. That question coming from Danielle, and I'm sure she's asking because she cares, and, and I'm sure she's asking because she thinks that what happened was so egregious that it needs to be dealt with. But as a white person, I assume that Danielle is white. As a white person, that can happen. You can go ahead and you can file your report and you can go ahead and, and complain up the ladder as far as you want to go. It's different for us. It's yeah. different for us going and saying something. We will be marked. We will be tainted. Things can happen to us that just won't happen to you. And I think that's the kind of quote unquote ignorance that, that surrounds the situation. And I'm not calling Daniela ignorant. I'm just saying that there's an ignorance in terms of how we have to approach it as opposed to the, the privilege that allows white people to approach it. And that, to me, is the underlying issue. We should be able to go to somebody and say, do you know what this guy just said to us? Do you know what he yeah. just implied by what he asked a friend of ours? But doing that's not going to get us nowhere. And understand this. This is the way that we have been at some points conditioned to react to racism. It's, you know what happened, you know what pissed you off, everybody in the room or in the situation knows that it's not right, but you know what, deal with it. Find your way to get through it, figure mm -hmm. out a way to get over it, don't talk about it, and just move on. That's what we've been told to do, and that's what society has tried to condition us to do now just think about it like this if i could use an analogy yeah the idea of a black child being born and has a weight on his back from the day that that child is born and the child gets stronger and gets more physically tough and is able to stand up strong and and carry that weight and then something else is added to him gets knocked down again, has to stand up and grows and gets stronger, and then things are just piling on top. Never does he get a chance to step away from the weight, get his energy, stiffen up a bit, and then pick the weight up again. It's always there, and it's always being added to. And at some point, it's either going to break you or you're going to break the weight. And right now we're in a situation where we're tired of the piling on. Mm -hmm. It can't continue to pile on. This has got to change. We're not going to break under this weight. And I, and I say this all the time. This fight is tiring, but we're not tired. So there's no end to this. And if it doesn't change, my concern is that there's going to be a major division 
not only in our country, in the U.S., but in the world are about this. And that's what we don't want. There's already enough issues with racism as it is. This better break it down or there's going to be some major repercussions. It, it, that division then speaks to what you said even in the first few minutes chatting here, Sherm, where the line has been drawn and you have to clearly indicate which side of the line you're on because there's no, there's, no, there's no playing both sides. There's no having a tone both waters. You're on one side or the, or the other, period. Um, I said to somebody earlier today, and I, I'll ask you if you, if, 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 if you agree with this statement, but I, I feel like even just in the last sure, 14 days, roughly, my initial thought was one thing I definitely know I need to do is do more of, which I, I always thought I was okay with, but clearly I wasn't, and I need to do more of, was listen, learn. But then I've, what I've quickly learned is I can't just listen. I need to be vocal. I need to use my voice. I need to use my platform. And I don't say my platform as a member of the media. I'm just talking about my platform as a man, as a person, anybody's platform. You need to have a voice, be vocal, and use your platform to speak up, not just listen. Speak up for, for what's right, what's wrong, and speak up for those that need or want or could use the help of your voice and your platform right now, not just someone who's sitting back, taking it in, listening and being respectful, but not really doing anything with it. Yeah, and I think when you talk about using platforms, it's got to be very, very clear that it can't seem to be an in-the-moment thing. Sure. It, it can't seem to be, you know, this is the, the issue of the day, so I'm going to jump on it and we're going to roll with it. Right. And, and also, sometimes when – and platforms are different and the pe way people utilize it are different. But what you did was you said, okay, I'm learning, but I got to do something. And, and understanding that it's not about asking the question of what to do. It's about figuring out what to do, mm -hmm. how to apply what you feel about the situation to make things better for other people. And, and I think that's the way to go, especially, and again, this is a fight that we've been fighting our whole lives. Clearly, we're not winning this fight. The majority has chosen to not allow us to have the say that we deserve. If the majority doesn't step in, then those of the majority that feel that what is happening is incorrect, if they don't step in, then we're behind it again. So the idea of the majority that believes that this is wrong they have to use their platform. And whatever that platform is, it has to be utilized and it has to be yelled at the top of their lungs to get their point and their message across. And I, th I think that when we say the side of privilege, we understand that every white person doesn't think that way. We understand that every white person is not racist. But what we understand is every white person has the ability and access to white privilege at any given time. And if you have that access, then you should say something about that. And the problem is, if you do say something about that, some people see it as, well, it's going to take away from what I get. Right. How am I supposed to keep my status? How am I supposed to keep my level up if I'm trying to even the playing field? You're a problem. You're the person that we're coming after. And you're the person we're saying, we're done with you. So there's a lot of ways to look at this. And, and I applaud the people that are standing up against racism and, and, and definitively and clearly stating where they stand. I applaud that. But it's got to be on a mass, massive scale in order to really get this message across with consistency. And it has to continue to happen. This is not something... It, and as much as the pandemic is a terrible thing, like we don't, none of us wanted to go through this pandemic. It's been horrible on so many levels for so many people. But the pandemic has created an atmosphere where the distractions are slowing down. We're not bombarded with things that pull us away from things that matter. 
and that has been maybe the silver lining in the pan in the pandemic. And I don't want anybody to take this as me saying the pandemic is good. It's not good. It's horrible. Yeah. It sucks. Yeah. It's brutal. But because we're alone, because we're isolated, we have the ability to really do some self introspection and really look at this from a perspective without the background noise and find out how we can all be a part of the positive outcome from this. Well, I think you said it well, even a few minutes ago, Sherm, to the point where there's no distractions. There's nobody, you can't go to a movie right now. You can't watch sports. You can't go to sporting events. The, the only thing that you're probably seeing when you're scroll, scrolling through Twitter, watching the news is COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter. It's, it's, that's it right now. And you can't hide from it and you shouldn't want to hide from it. You should want to tackle it head on. Uh, otherwise, to your point, you've clearly shown then your true colors and yes. what side you're on. And, and I would agree with that. It's, it's, it's forcing you to have um, public and personal, I think, uh, introspection in terms, in terms of what you're feeling, what your girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse might be feeling, what, what, what you may or may not be teaching your children how your neighbors are reacting, how your community is reacting, everything. You're, it's, we're, 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 we're starting to see, I think, the true, as I said, the true colors of a lot of people, hopefully more for the pro, but there's certainly a lot of that con that's seeping out as well. And, and, and we're seeing the negative side and the ugly side to a lot of people too. Yeah, and, and, and we're seeing it, but we've seen it. I mean, we've seen the ugly side to people. I, I think what we're seeing now is, is the silence or the, the, what I call the mute voices that are happening now because they don't want to get involved. They don't mm -hmm. want to, when this thing clears up, they don't want people to look back and remember things that they said and potentially take it against them or use it against them. And we're watching, we're seeing, taking notes. That's not going to go unnoticed. And, and those are the people that, look, you and I understand that if people have to be excused out of my life, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not concerned about that. Especially coming out of this pandemic, all of the things that are happening during this pandemic are allowing me to realize that you got to clean some things up. This is me personally saying this about myself. I got to clean some things up. I got to do some, some introspection and look at myself and, and see what's working for me coming out of this situation. And one of the things I'm realizing that this, this racism topic has really shone a light on is that I don't have time for it. I don't have time for people who, who condone it, who choose not to say anything about it, for people who are trying to protect their little thing at the expense of the greater good of the people in their life and the people globally, I'm done with you. I don't have time for it. And I have no problems telling people that face to face. And for me, that's cleaning it up. That's understanding that you and I cannot vibe the way we used to vibe. There's a clear problem and difference of philosophy that I'm unwilling to look past in this moment to continue our relationship. So I'm moving on and I have no guilt about it. And, you know, the tough thing about it is a lot of the environment that we work in presents issues like that. And we work with a lot of great people. Don't get me wrong. The majority of people that we work with are very good people, but there are some that we have issues with. And those are going to be interesting dynamics when we get back to work to have to clear those up as well. But the struggle is not going to stop. People are going to have issues. I'm going to have issues. And those discussions are going to be hard. And they're going to be coming consistently, not really concerned about the outcomes. Sherm, how much do you think all of this could potentially impact the sporting world as well? Uh, and again, listen, in the grand scheme of things, that's, that's small potatoes, some may feel. And, and that's probably fair. But how much do you think this, this impacts um, let's, let's look specifically at the NBA, the sport that, that we cover and that we follow, where I would argue, I don't even honestly know what the exact number is, but it's got to be over three quarters of, you know, the NBA's players are, are black and people of color. 
Um, do the players react to coaches, management, um, stat, team staff, media, wh whomever it may be that are in large part predominantly white? And how much of an impact does that have, do you think, I guess I say, on the sporting world? I think that because in the sporting world, a lot of us have been around a long time and players understand who they like, who they don't like, who they get along with, who they don't get along with. I think there is going to be some, as we, some pushback from players in certain mm -hmm. situations. And maybe it's justified based on what they have going on and understand about people. But I, I don't think we can expect or should assume that these players should not say what they feel and should not act accordingly in terms of calling out what they see as racism or calling out things that they feel are unjust. Agreed. You just talked about the platform that, that you and I have. Well, their platform is way bigger than ours. Yep. So they have to utilize their platform as well. And we've seen many athletes use their platform over the last few weeks. So I applaud them. I think that it has to continue to happen. And we've seen athletes get called out for using their platform in a way that didn't didn't fit in terms of the idea of racism and what it looked like to them. So I just think that there's going to be some disruption and, and any movement has to have discourse. You just don't ask for things as, as we've, we've proven over our history and you get it. Discourse usually happens when there's drastic changes that have to occur. So the level of discourse is going to be controlled by the powers that choose to not react to the message that's being sent directly. So players, athletes, say what you have to say. Be direct. Take a stand. If you want to shut things down, shut things down. Do whatever you want to do to prove your point and get the message across with consistency, and I applaud that. Sure. Let me be clear, make sure I'm very clear in saying this. It's not like the NBA is, is without issue as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, without problems, uh, is it fair to say that, at least in terms of the four major sports, when we talk about Major League Baseball, the National Hockey League, the NFL, the NBA has, whether they have room to improve or not, I don't think we can argue. Sure, they do. Everybody does. But have they been better? Has the league, has Adam Silver and, and the league office been better at supporting these causes and supporting the players and allowing them to have that voice that's needed and not trying to muzzle them or contain them like we've seen with other commissioners and other sports, not just in the last three to five years, but over the last decade plus? That's a tough question because I have to really wrap my mind around all the events that have happened in okay. a specific okay. sport, but I can just speak recently. I mean, when Adam Silver took over from David Stern, he had the Donald Sterling situation fall right on his lap right away that had to be addressed. And to me, that was the moment of truth early in Adam Silver's career as commissioner. And I thought he handled it without any question about where he stood and what he was willing to support and stand up for. And that sent a clear message, not only in the world of the NBA and basketball, but across the landscape of sports that the NBA was willing to throw an owner out of the league for the way that this owner spoke about and treated people of, of, of color. And that to me is a huge statement. Now you look back a few years with something like Colin Kaepernick kneeling for the national anthem, for the flag and the national anthem and how that was handled that was disappointing. That, that was yeah. something that should have been handled differently. And to see the NFL have to come around after the murder of George Floyd and make a statement actually taking steps back to say, look, we were wrong. We support this. We're not against this. They had to do some house cleaning to figure out how to make sure that they didn't make the mistake again. I tip my hat they didn't make the mistake again but the mistake shouldn't have been made in the first place. So I can't really speak to the history of the NFL. As you know, I'm not the biggest NFL fan, so yep. I haven't watched it like that, but I can speak for the NBA and Adam Silver 
has been very clear about his stance on racism and his desire and want for players to use their platform to speak about whatever they want to speak about. Doesn't put them in a box and say, don't touch these topics. He supports their free speech and their ability and desire to tackle any topic that they want to tackle. Sure. I, Listen, I, 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 I want to talk Raptors, but this is obviously a very important conversation, and, we, and I'd like to continue on this for at least a few more minutes uh, if, if, if you're willing to. Um, I know we touched on this in our previous conversation, but given the fact that you've played in so many different countries and, and, and places around the world, were things ever any better anywhere you went, or were, was it the same issues always sort of bubbling above or beneath the surface, no matter where you were? Uh, it, there, was, there was always things bubbling. Um, mm -hmm. You got to remember, I, I played in Finland, I played in Argentina, I played in Lithuania, and I played in Germany. Yeah. So three of those four countries are white. Germany and their history with racism, they've done everything to try and really move themselves away from that that tag of a racist country and they've done a good job of of getting away from that in a lot of respects but it's funny i'll give you an example i, I was playing in germany and a coach from the states came over to germany to coach our team and we're sitting at a team dinner like one of the first nights that he got there and he's like everybody i got a joke i got a joke i got a joke and he he used to, he spent his summers up north in Canada. So he knows the Canadian culture. Okay. So we're sitting at the table and he's like, I got a joke. And, and he's like, what are black people good for in Canada? So now my, my antennas are up. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, what? And I'm looking at him like, you better be careful about what you say right now. And he said, I'm not making this up, for making pucks. So instead of choking him on the spot, I got up and left. Right. It was a team dinner. I got up and left, got in my car, went back to my condo. Management calling me, where are you? I'm not answering the phone. The next day, management comes knocking on my door. We're so sorry. We're so sorry and, and, and apologize. I said, look, this is not your fault. What I'm going to say to you is simple. I said, you have two choices here. Either I'm leaving or he's leaving. Yeah. There's no other discussion to have. I don't want to talk and I don't want him to apologize. I don't want to even see this guy. Send me a ticket, send me home or get rid of him. And I asked him to leave. To their credit, he was on the next plane out of there. So, again, the idea of, of racism being kind of in this corner of the world called the U.S., it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's all over the globe. But you got to understand, that's a minute part of my experience in Germany. The majority of my experience in Germany was amazing. Meeting people, living in the, in the, in the, the culture there, and understanding and getting to learn things, it was phenomenal. Lithuania, same thing. When I got there, they didn't see a lot of black people. So there was this ignorance of what staring can say about you. And a lot of the kids and adults would just stare at me. And it took a lot in me to not jump at people and say, what are you staring at? Yeah. And, you know, you're, you're kind of outnumbered and you understand that this is a process that has to happen over time and allow them to acclimate and understand that you're going to be here and this is going to be something they're going to have to deal with. And the more time went on, the more you, you kind of bumped into some people that spoke English and they saw you in the restaurants, they saw you in their grocery stores, in their coffee shops, all of that, in their community, is the more the looks went away to actual conversations. So again, it's always there. It's always, and this is what I was talking to you about. Like that weight is always on our back. It's always there. We don't get a chance to put it down. 
And when we start to straighten up, something else is thrown on our back. And it tries to knock us down. And I, I can speak to it personally. There is no break. There's no break. And because there's no break, there's a toughness, there's a resiliency, but there's also an anger that builds towards it and anything that represents it. And now it's at a tipping point. Do you remember the time that you had the conversation or, or the conversation I should say was had with you as a, as a young man, as a, as a young boy? Well, as I spoke about in my last, uh, our last yeah. live, my dad died when, when I was 18, he was pretty much incapacitated at 16. So I didn't, I didn't have and that sure, opportunity. I will say respectfully, I obviously knew that I just assumed that it might've happened before that, unfortunately, because of the way that you may have had to grow up and where you grew up and what young black people might've had to deal with. I would have assumed that perhaps this is something you might've had to have at 12, 13, 14, not necessarily at 16 or 18 years old. That was just an assumption on my part, even knowing that your father had passed away. Right, right. Um, so for me, the majority of those conversations happened on the street with my friends. Mm -hmm. Figuring out how to deal with it was just stuff that we kind of went through as kids. You know, we'd see people get roughed up by the cops. It would happen to us. You know, there, there'd be situations where guys got really hurt by the cops or guys getting arrested for stupid stuff cops just making stuff up and planting stuff but those were the discussions that happened amongst us and they were more geared towards those a-hole cops the individuals that were doing it but it also created a, a line a demarcation of how to deal with police officers you didn't want to because it never turned out well so we stayed away from police we, we you know we caused trouble but we stayed away from police and, and trying to create this bond in the community that wasn't happening in Malton. So unfortunately I didn't have that discussion with an adult who could talk to me about ways to deal with the police. Um, but you learn pretty quickly. We're not in a situation where, you know, we, we get to sit there and, and, and have these conversations and have cops come to the, the local community cent community center or the high school and, and sit down with us. At the end of the year, we usually played a fundraising game against the police officers, and we tried to destroy them because that was the legal spot that we could go after them. But other than that, we, there was very little interaction with the cops that were positive growing up because the people I knew, the friends I knew, they, the cops weren't very good to them. And uh, I'm not saying that all the people I knew and, and the friends I knew were angels because they weren't. They did some things. But I, I, I knew from a very early age that the treatment wasn't fair with the way that cops dealt with us. Well, I, I told part of this story last week, Sherman, just to kind of, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if it, not, not that maybe your point needs amplifying or solidifying because it's, it's facts, period. But just to compare ourselves, if we go back uh, 25 plus years now, um, my experience in, in maybe not quite Malton, but Malton, Etobicoke area, uh, going to Humber College and living at Highway tw 27 and Finch yep. for six years, both in school and out of school. Ask me how many times I had any run-ins with the police living at Finch and 27 for six years. Zero. Zero. Yep. Zero. And that's walking to and from the college. That's walking to and from the Woodbine Center, the racetrack, JJQs, JJ Mugs, the yep. Tropical General Hospital. Yep. Uh, you know, walking up to to the arena, Westwood Arena, I believe, just yep. up the road. Yep. Walking yep. to walking to the uh, the the, the twenty seven uh, flea market, yep. all that stuff. Six years, yep. zero, zero interactions with the police. And and the one time during college that I did, and I told the story to Jonesy last week. Now, granted, it was it was it was Metro cops. It was in Toronto, not in in Etobicoke, Malton area. Um, was when I was like 100% designated driver, didn't have a drop of alcohol in my system, but I had three completely obliterated guys in the car with me. And I got pulled over for doing about 125 on the gardener, was pulled into the backseat of a cop car with the doors locked, had to do a breathalyzer. And when I blew zero, the door was opened. I was let back to my car and I was told to drive away, be safe next time <laughs> and have a good night. Now, was part of that because they were actually surprised that I was sober 
maybe, but was a major reason for it. The fact that I was white, I'm sure that was a huge factor in it. And I walked away, not even with a speeding ticket, but let alone with any other sort of ticket infraction or otherwise, it was scot-free. See you later. You're good. And that just speaks to it right there. Yeah. And, uh, you kind of chipped out, but I, I get the gist of what you're saying. Um, <laughs> It's it's interesting. Even up to a couple of years ago, I was driving on the 407, and I was speeding, no doubt about it. I was speeding. And yeah. uh, a cop pulled up beside me and kind of looked at me sternly. He was like, slow down. I, I said, sorry. Kind of waved him off and said, sorry, slow down. This cop decided to follow me for about another five minutes. And I guess during that time, he was punching in my license plate and, and doing all that stuff. He throws his cherries on and pulls me over. Yeah. All right. Pull over. And immediately, like, while the cherries are on, I'm like, what's the protocol? Don't move. Get your hands on top of the steering wheel now so that he doesn't think you're moving and come to the car with an, a different attitude. And when he comes to the window, wind it down. I do that. I wind it down. He's like, you know you're speeding? I'm like, yep. Yeah. He's like, what are you speeding for? I said, I'm late. I was late. He said, so what? You think you're better than everybody else? You can risk everybody's life because you're late? I said, no, officer. I was wrong for speeding. Now, right there, I know the interaction is trying to be forced into a contentious state because the idea would have been to say, no, what do you think? I'm stupid. Yep. I know it's speeding, but no, I see where he's going with this. Whatever I said, no, officer. He says, let me see your license and registration. I look at him. Hands are still, like, straight-armed on the steering wheel. And uh, I look. I said, my, my registration is in my glove compartment, and my license is in my armrest. I'm talking to him, and I tell him that. I said, I'm going to take my hands off the steering wheel, and I'm going to go into these parts of my car to get the stuff you want. He's like, yeah, move slowly. All right, so I do it, get the stuff handed to him. He says, wait here. He goes to the car. He goes and he does his thing, comes back. And I had the, the old earpiece like you have, you know, the one that yeah. with the cord attached yeah. to my phone. He gives my stuff back. He's like, were you on the phone? Did you pick up your phone? Did you use your phone? I said, no. He said, how do you answer it? I said, I just click the button and it answers if I have to talk. He yeah. says, I don't believe you. You guys always lie. You guys. You guys always lie. Yeah. And again, all I'm thinking about is getting out of here. But it's just that simple that if I had said something to him that he didn't like, who knows where that could have gone. But the antagonistic approach that he brought to me, I'm just glad. I, I'm, as you know, I'm pretty laid back in terms of it takes a lot to get me upset. But I'm glad I didn't have a quick trigger or a fast mouth with him in that situation. But it's just to your point, you're told to drive safe and get home okay. Yeah. I'm told all you guys lie. This was two years ago. Right. I got to tuck that away and keep it moving. It's done. There's nothing mm -hmm. I can do about that. So it's just so different and it's so consistent and it's egregious. And I'm tired of it, and we're done. Not you and I, but I'm done with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And 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 <laughs> jo joking aside, with only a couple of minutes left here, uh, listen, I, I I don't know that it needs to be said. You you know me, I know you, but I will say it. You know, to you, whether there's an audience here or not, you know what side I stand on, and you know that I've got your back and, and that you have an ally in me. So I, you know, I, I, I would, I'll say that to you personally, publicly, privately, or otherwise, that's where I stand. Um, we only have a few minutes left here. It might not even be fair for me to, to say this in five minutes or less, but Sherm, the one thing I've noticed, and I think, again, I think I said this to Jonesy either on a show or even just on a, on a, on a, on a phone call recently. I don't know how the U S and again, this is not to say that there aren't issues here in Canada, let alone around the world. But speaking specifically about the U.S. for a second, I don't know how, especially in the South, things have not boiled over 
even worse than they have right now, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, almost now four years ago. Because at the risk of being overly political here, I have felt the difference. We spend as much time in the United States as we do in Canada when we travel all year. And I've noticed, even as a white guy from Canada, the racial tension that has existed in the United States in the last four years since Trump went in office, it is, in my opinion, I don't know if you agree, it's worse than it was when there was a black man in office for eight years. It's worse than it was prior to Obama. It's the worst I've ever seen. And I've been traveling to the U.S. for 15 years now doing Raptor games. In these last four years, I have felt it. I have felt it, even myself walking the streets, the racial tension that exists, especially in the U.S. Oh, no question about it. And if you remember, we were in Oklahoma City the day that Trump got elected. Yep. Yep. And it was a sick feeling. I remember waking up that morning and, like, remember saying, like, this is going to change the world. So to your point, there's all kinds of issues that we've encountered in terms of discussions and the way that Americans feel about what's happening in their country. So it's horrible. It, it, it's, you know, that guy has, has done a terrible job. And he's really enabled and given a platform to people that have some disgusting views about people. And he's been the guy who's kind of emboldened that stance and given those people a platform to speak on. So he's just been terrible. And I just want to touch on this quickly. You know, what's happening now, this world needs to be addressed it's not only for us, it's for the kids, it's for the generations coming after us. We need yeah. to fight this fight for them quickly. My daughter said to me the other day, she's 14, she said to me the other day, Dad, are you afraid? I said, afraid of what? She said, afraid of the police and what they might do to you, because I'm afraid. And I told her, I said, no fear. We don't operate in fear. You speak your mind, you say what you have to say, but don't operate in fear and don't be afraid for me. And it just, it just reinforced the idea that this has to happen for my kids, for kids that look like her, for kids that look like a little boy across the street. This has to happen for them. And, and again, if I'm not even fighting for me, then I'm fighting for my daughter and kids that look like her. Sure. Uh, I listen, I really appreciate the, the insight, the perspective over the last hour. Um, for anybody watching, I, I, I think this goes without saying, this was far more um, important than, yeah. than even talking about an anniversary of a championship. Uh, it's hard to imagine where we've come in one year, or maybe I should say where we've fallen in one year. Uh, Thank you, Sherm, for this. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, let's hope we can continue the conversation because we have to keep the conversation going uh, and do much more than just talk as well. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. And uh, this was a great conversation. And this has to happen more often. Sherm, thanks, man. Be well. All right. Take care, Eve. All the best. You too, bud.